You may have heard of Alexander Nikishin. He's the top prospect of the Hurricanes. There are certain things preventing him from coming to North America, but we're going to talk about that and what he could bring if and when he does get over here. So I touched on this in another video, um, but I'm just going to say it again real quick. This channel is not political. This video is not political. I will not entertain any political comments, and I will not make any political statements. This is strictly to paint a picture of what's going on, why Alexander Nikishin joining the Hurricanes will be difficult and maybe even impossible. But this is strictly to paint that picture. So Alexander Nikishin currently plays for SKA St. Petersburg in the Continental Hockey League, otherwise known as the KHL or, in slang terms, the K. He was drafted by the Hurricanes 69th overall in the third round in 2020. The NHL has agreements with all the other leagues in Europe in regards to bringing players from places like Czech Extra Liga or SM Liga in Finland or the Swedish Hockey League over to North America to play for NHL teams. And basically, it comes down to players having NHL out clauses in their contracts. The one league that had a different dynamic with the NHL over there was the KHL, and by extension its minor league affiliate, the VHL, which is basically like the AHL but in Russia. The memorandum of understanding that was between the NHL and KHL, to be s simply put, is an understanding that prevented the NHL from poaching players from the KHL and vice versa. However, after the war in Ukraine started, that was completely suspended and an already sort of complicated and convoluted process got a whole lot worse. This is particularly affecting the Hurricanes at the moment because Alexander Nikishin is now considered by many to be the top prospect. He has been taking the KHL by storm and he's considered to be the best defenseman in the KHL and he's only 21 years old. Now, here's where things get complicated, and geopolitics, and money, and all that type of stuff has got to get discussed. SKA St. Petersburg is owned by a really big company called Gazprom, and this company is state-controlled. In other words, the government dictates everything that it does, and by extension, Russia's government is completely controlled by one guy, Vladimir Putin. Take a wild guess who Vladimir Putin's favorite hockey team is. It's SKA St. Petersburg. So essentially, albeit there was a little bit more to it and it's very subversive in nature, SKA St. Petersburg was allowed to circumvent the salary cap for the sake of putting most of the Olympic team together and have it playing together prior to the Olympics in Korea in 2018. So essentially, they used the KHL to practice for the Olympics that they were probably going to win even if they just sent their best since the NHL players weren't there. So Gazprom, the owner of SKA St. Petersburg, uses their immense wealth and their influence that they have by way of the government to constantly have their depth chart loaded, and they intimidate other teams through those means to make incredibly lopsided trades, and one of those lopsided trades was what resulted in Alexander Nikishin going from Spartak Moscow, who he was with when the Hurricanes initially drafted him, over to the powerhouse that is SKA St. Petersburg. So all foreign policy things considered, be it of the United States government, the Russian government, the KHL, and the NHL, players coming over here has become very complicated. So essentially this has led to a lot of speculation about will Nikishin be able to join the Hurricanes at all when his contract with SKA is up, which will be after the end of next season. So, albeit in the case of Nikishin, we can't definitively say yes or no either way. The good news is there has been several players make it over that were playing for SKA St. Petersburg since the war started. Most notable being Andre Kuzmenko, Kirill Marchenko, and Ivan Morozov. But there is cause for a little bit of concern considering that there's no definitive precedent or no definitive agreement set that would bring him over here. Yaroslav Askarov has also made it over here and he was the Predators first round pick from a few years ago. So it's not totally out of the question and I would say it's also more than likely that Kishin will be able to make it over to North America when his contract is over. So now here's where we're going to talk about the money a little bit. It is rumored, I just read the stuff online, I have no way to confirm it, that the Hurricanes actually offered SKA St. Petersburg a million dollars to buy out his contract and bring him over here now. That would be monumental for the Hurricanes, because then at that point, you wouldn't have to worry about filling the hole that would potentially be left if Brady Shea is to move on. And then you're looking at, over the course of the next couple of seasons, the top four defensemen for the Hurricanes are going to be Slavin, Burns, 
potentially Pesci if he sticks around, if not Pesci Chatfield, and then Nikishin, and that is an absolutely stacked top four. And then when Burnsy is done playing, which I know is a hard to conceive thing because the guy just is an absolute animal and it looks like he's going to play until he's 100 years old, eventually he is going to hang it up or he might go somewhere else, but I would imagine he's going to retire as a hurricane. Scott Morrow will probably be who takes his place. I'm going to have to show some numbers here on the screen here for all this to make sense. So if the Hurricanes really did offer a million dollars to buy Nikishin out of his contract, that is the equivalent of 83,892,617 rubles. But for the sake of publicity, I'd imagine that we're not going to get him over here before that. I would love to see him over here before that, but I don't think that it's feasible all things foreign policy wise and every other circumstance that there is considered he probably won't be over here that early so enough about the geopolitics enough about the foreign policy let's talk about the player so i want to put a scene package and do an analysis on this kid the only thing is i don't know how the khl is as far as using their highlights the nhl is pretty lenient on it and everything like that especially if you voice it over and break it up and everything like that typically there's no copyright issues with that that i understand now, considering what I just talked about, you might understand why I have a little bit of apprehension of using KHL footage so freely, but I am going to look into it. Either way, I'm going to do a, a deep dive on the kid and present some analytical stuff, even if I can't use the footage. But here's the basics. He's an incredibly good skater. His edge work is really good, especially when he's going backwards, which is something that you definitely need as a defenseman. His poke checking ability is really good. His stick work's really good. I'd say it's a, it's a touch below the caliber of about Brett Pesci's, but it's definitely enough. It is definitely above average for someone who's considered to be more of an offensive-minded puck-moving defenseman, which he is. In 65 games in the Continental Hockey League, he had 55 points. So doing some quick math, that's 0.84 points per game for a defenseman. Granted, we also have to consider he's on a stacked team that's literally rigged against everybody else in the league. It doesn't take away from the fact that he's a 0.84 point per game player. KHL also has a shorter season than the NHL. They only play 68 games as opposed to 82. He's also incredibly physical and he uses his size very well. Because of his physicality, this kid's name is Boom. I'm like I'm not even joking. Like his literal nickname is just Boom. So oh, here's how some of the stuff might translate over at the NHL level. The most notable thing the ice surface over in Europe, or pretty much anywhere that has double IHF ice or Olympic ice, whatever you want to call it, is 200 by 100, whereas in North America, it's 200 by 85. Smaller surfaces, he's definitely going to probably increase that physicality. It takes a lot less time to close a gap, and it's not as easy to evade checks on the smaller ice surface. So I can see his hit totals going up. His point totals may stay steady. They may drop a little bit. It wouldn't surprise me if he still ended up being about 0.6 points per game and had about a 15-goal season, especially if he starts quarterback in the power play, which he's totally capable of. And like I said before, he's only 21. He's probably not completely grown into his full body yet. And he's already six foot four and 216 pounds. The only way I could see it being a problem is maybe there's a lot of players who have come over to North America after spending their entire career in Europe, and they have a bit of a difficulty adjusting to the smaller ice. With Nikishin, I don't see that being a problem. And even if it is, you can send him down to the minors for a little bit, and I think he'll get used to it, but I really don't think that that's going to be necessary. All in all, I think he'll make an immediate impact, and we're not going to miss Brady Shea for long whenever he leaves the Hurricanes, if he leaves the Hurricanes, which I do think he will. So that's all I've got for right now, but I want to know what you guys think. Leave me a comment about it. Um, let me know if you would like to see the video of about Nikishin's advanced stats and the highlight package and all that type of stuff. Like I said, I just got to double check the ins and outs to make sure that there won't be any copyright issues me using KHL footage. And considering some of the stuff I've talked about in this video, you may understand why I have those concerns. I just wanted to put that out there. If you like what you saw, please uh, drop me a like. Like I said, make a comment, subscribe, and there's going to be a whole lot more content coming out soon. So thanks. I'll see you next time. Y'all take care. And above all, free Nikishin.